Yo, 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 big aloha and welcome to Real Talk Hip Hop Hawaii. I'm your host, Ja Sun, and we're coming to you from Inside Out Universe Studios in Haiku, Maui. We got a very, very special guest today. We got the one and only Grouch up in the building. What's Peace up? and love, y'all. What's up, Ja Sun? Thank you for having me, bro. Heck yeah, man. Honored to have you. Glad to be here. And uh, much respect, and it's great to have you up in here. We got the legend, the living legend oh, up in Lord. the... Oh, Lord. Man, we got, a, we got a lot to talk about here. Do we? I think so. All right, let's so see. Let's, uh, you're from Oakland? I yeah? am. You're born and raised? Born and, and raised in Oakland. Um, lived there till I was about 22. Nice. Yeah. That's what's up. Yeah. You went to Sky, Skyline High School, yeah? Uh, I went to Skyline High School. That's what's I, up. I spent some time at another high school called Bishop O'Dowd. That's what's I went up. there with Latif, the truth speaker, who That's was out here up. the other night. Yeah, you guys just performed. Yeah, and then Skyline is, uh, you know, Dale the Funky, Homo Sapien, Casual. Um, yeah, I was just going to ask, like, who all did you go to high school with? That's Tom what, Hanks yeah. went to that school. Oh, wow. That's yeah. crazy. And a, a bunch of sports players that I don't really know. Word, word. Know, but, yeah, there's That's a lot of up. people came out of Oakland. So, um Man, like, what influenced you to, like, get into hip-hop? What was, like, the first hip-hop you ever heard? And what, like, kind of sparked your interest into being into hip-hop? I mean, when I, was a, when I was a young kid, I used to have a radio by, by my bed. And it was, you know, right next to my ear. And I would just scan the radio dial every day, every night before I go to sleep. And, um, you know, I used to listen to, like, Duran Duran and New Wave kind of what else? Tears for Fears and stuff like that. But at the same time, I was listening to Michael Jackson. Yeah. And uh, he's the one who really got me into like soul, black music. And then from there came like, like I just remember like, uh, I don't even know all the names of like the, the electronic semi-hip-hop early sounds that were coming out and I used to like the break dancing yeah, music yeah, yeah. you know and that's what really when, when I saw break dancing and heard the music that went next to that I really started to get into it and then you know diving deeper there was a station called k Poo in Oakland and that was just like a uh, you know just like a small tiny radio station mm -hmm. actually it came out of San Francisco that's what's up they were playing you know, they were playing Too Short, and they were playing Boogie Down Productions, and Rakim, and, you know, Big Daddy Kane, and That's Public Enemy, and stuff like that. And that, and when I heard that, I just, I was sold. That, That's that was up. it for me. And then when I realized that Too Short was from Oakland, and, you know, started to follow him, and buy his tapes, and, like, he was like the legend in Oakland. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, and then plus he was saying cuss words and stuff like that on record i was like wow i never heard anything like this i was i got all into dirty rap like yeah, yeah. two live crew and even beastie boys said some foul shit yeah, and yeah. so like that was my early stuff and and uh ll cool j too. did you ever rap like, like that MC. did you ever put because you must have you i know. never really got i wasn't really into the nasty rap what yeah, i took yeah. from too short was the simple styles the yeah, simple yeah. patterns and the slow delivery, and that's just how I've yeah. always been. I've always been like a chill, laid back kind of dude. Yeah, so yeah. that's what I rolled with, and that's what I felt like, you know, Too Short brought to the table was that style. And then his content was his content. Yeah. But I was like, oh man, I, I, I like that shit. And yeah. so, that's what's up. You know, that, that inspired me earlier on. Earlier yeah. on. That's what's up. Yeah, as a kid. But then, you know, going further and further, like getting into high school and watching High Roll, that really like kicked me into like, oh shit, I could do this. How much older were they? Were like a couple like, years, yeah. You they, know, depending on who who they were. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, one or were two, they they three. were doing some more stuff, and then when you guys were getting on and stuff. Did well, they... I was seeing them at school rapping, and just you know, hip hop culture at school was big. Yeah. You know, Oakland. It was like back then. Not everybody listened to rap. Rap wasn't already the most popular culture in the world. Yeah, it was more just of like a niche. It was becoming that. Yeah. And so only certain people were into hip hop and you could identify them For when sure. you went to school. Like, oh, that dude wears his belt like that and his pants like that. I bet he listens to hip hop. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. that dude's chewing on a licorice stick and he's got on a beanie this way. I bet he listens to hip hop. And so it was like you kind of see eye to eye 
already just like by the the way these people are rocking their styles yeah, and you yeah. know who's into what you're into yeah. and so and then they see you you see them yeah, and there's almost like a yeah, mutual like, yeah. respect and, and you're then, like hey what's up yeah. what's up what's and up? then you're going to i mean i was going to events outside of school and uh you know see the homies up there and then you start to develop this little culture within your city and like a like a family or like an extended family like all oh, that's and then people separate themselves into crews that's the high row crew that's the living legends crew that's the uh you know there was this crew called um man why did I blank on their name? Cytoplasms mm. was another big crew out of the Bay, yeah. and Hobo Junction and yeah, yeah, Latirix's yeah. crew, Quantum, yeah, you yeah. know, uh, Black Alicious, and so, and then there was um, Board Stiff out of San Francisco. Yeah, so yeah, there's all the these people stuff. that are like our peers, starting to emerge with their own, you know albums and styles and that's a lot of groups you know that's a lot of groups right there in the bay and then you take it down to southern california and then there's like jurassic five far side freestyle fellowship um people under the stairs people under the stairs visionaries and so many la symphony and then it's like we're all in the same age range and we're all putting out independent music and it's like you know start to learn all these people and meet all these people and uh, it was just dope, dope yeah. timing. That's yeah. some of my favorite hip hop, like all the artists that yeah. like you were just talking about, like name like, too. That's Mine like too. all the stuff I was listening to and coming up and being inspired by and making me want to rap and stuff. Because I was like into, I was really into like Busta Rhymes and Wu Tang and like mostly East Coast stuff, a little mm-hmm. bit of West Coast gangster stuff. But then when I heard like all this underground stuff come out, I was like, whoa, there's, this is like the voice I've been looking for. This is like, like this is what I'm feeling and I related to it so much that it just inspired me inspired right on me. Uh, yeah. so um so you were rapping like by yourself at first yeah when i was younger i had a homie um jelani and he was going to another school and he had a little crew and they were recording stuff already and i would hear what they were recording and i was like man that's dope i want to i want to be down and he was like well this is already our crew over here and we all go to school together but me and you could work on something and we'll have our own thing and yeah. so we saved up a little bit of money Got like a really old school sampler. It was called a Mirage, and that's kind of a fitting name because we thought it was going to be able to make these <laughs> beats for us, but it had like 2.5 sampling seconds on it or something like that. Maybe a little more. It was like very, very limited. We'd mm-hmm. have to speed the record up like quadruple time and then slow down the samples once we got them in there just to like make best use yeah, of yeah. the uh, technology. And, um, you know, we made a couple beats on that. And then, you know, we would sit with a tape recorder in the car and play the beats that we made on a cassette in the car stereo and then use the, you know, the inside of the car as our studio. And, like, depending on how far we placed the, um, the tape recorder from the speakers and how far we were with our mouths from the tape recorder that would be like how we were mixing the levels yeah, and shit, yeah. you know so yeah. that's how i started that's what's up initially i wanted to be a beat maker only but my homie had got me into he was like come on write these raps and that's what's i up. remember writing my first rap and being so off beat and like how do i come in on the beat you know and like this isn't for me huh. and then i just fell in love with like the challenge a little bit and said you know can i get better at this that's awesome. let me see what i can do you know if i continue oh yeah that's what's up yeah and to be able to do both too is a skill that not a lot of people have yeah there's a lot of rappers that, that just don't even know like me including like i, I can't make a beat to save oh, you my could life. though man yeah. you could you'd be yeah. surprised i mean I'm, i've made a couple over yeah. the years that like i was like oh that was decent but i don't so what was uh, so you had that mirage and then what was like the next sampling piece that like really got you into beat producing? It was crazy back then because you know you needed this hardware to make the beats. Yeah. You know there wasn't beat making programs on your phone or anything like that. You know kids didn't even have phones yeah, you had to in have their a pockets at that time. Piece so, of equipment. You know the whole Bay Area radius. If you were really into hip hop, you kind of had like your ear to the street as far as who has a studio at their house, Mm -hmm. who has an SP-1200, who has an ASR-10, who has an MPC-3000. And there wasn't 
a lot of people with him. There's like 25 people doing it at that time. Like, oh, so-and-so has an SP-1200 at his house. Let's see if we can go over there after school, you know? Yeah, yeah. Or, you know, what does is, what is A-plus make his beats on? I heard he has an ASR-10, you know? So when I heard that, I was like, that's the machine I want, you know? I, I had a homie who had an SP-1200, which is what... Dell made his beats on, Pete Rock made his beats on, oh. and, you know, so many, a lot of East Coast producers and, like, Bomb Squad and people who made Public Enemy beats and Ice Cube beats and stuff like Shit. that. You know, that was one of the, that was one of the weapons, SP-1200. But then, you know, for this hip-hop kind of, like, you know, less gritty, melodic non-gangster sound i was hearing that people were using asr 10s mm -hmm. you know and that's uh and that's what i decided i wanted to get so when i was 18 years old the day i was able to go get a credit card i went got it maxed it out the machine cost like 2500 dollars, which is crazy yeah, that's a lot back for, then, for a, a young kid you know yeah. so and back then and so I dropped that, got myself in some debt, and then started learning the machine, you know. That's dope. And, uh, and you, you didn't really know anything? I didn't know it. anything about making, I mean, I had the Mirage before, yeah. but it was so limited that when I got the ASR-10, I had these options, and I was like, where do I start? I knew somebody else with one. I was like, man, how do you, how do you start a beat? You yeah. know, I remember asking him, like, he was like, well, listen to the percussion. It goes like this. You know, and then like you put your snare here, you put your hi-hat here. And uh, I remember just starting with that information and going and then figuring it out That's on my own it. after that, you know. Did you ever have any uh, formal music training or you just kind of figured everything out? No, my just, dad yeah. was, a, that's what he did for a profession. He was a music player. You oh, that's know? what's up. Yeah, so he... He had kind of like an independent um, Bay Area music career hustle. Cool. That's what he did for a living, you know. That's what's and up. so he just, you know, he he was an awesome musician, but he never cracked. And like, you know, a lot of people he played with turned out to be bigger and word, word. you know, but he, he was dope. Yeah. That's what's and up. so but no, I didn't have any Training. I didn't live with my dad. That just maybe passed through blood. Or yeah, something, I was just gonna say it was in your blood. Yeah. Um, that's what's up. There was one thing I was gonna say too. I never knew that you produced the Felt album. Oh, the first one. Yeah, yeah, the very the first one. Like. Yeah, first Felt that's album. Dope. You made you made all the beats on that. I did. That's awesome. Yeah, Merson Slug yeah. came to me and said, "We're doing a project. Do you want to produce it?" I was like, "Hell yeah!" They were like, "We're gonna be, in, you know, Slug's gonna be in L.A. in three days." You know, and so I was like, "Oh shit, I better make some beats." I didn't yeah. have any beats at the time, you know. Yeah. It's in uh, like they showed up in a couple of days, and I had probably th five, six, seven, eight beats, and they were like, "Well, we like these three, you know." And so I said, and, and then they come in and they start recording songs hella fast. Like those two guys are fast, yeah. so they were like, "Okay, these three songs are done." You're like, what? "We're coming back tomorrow." <laughs> You know, <laughs> you're going to have more shit? And I'm like, of course, you know. And oh, then I'm shit. like stressing out. They leave. Oh, shit, I got to make hella beats. So every night I was making like four beats or five beats, you know, after they would leave. And then yeah. they'd come back and say, well, we like these two, yeah. you know. And then I had to just keep making them the whole, you know, it took about, it was quick. Like the way they wanted to do it, it was like two weeks total. Wow. So. That's awesome. So that's a really good album too. I, that's one of my favorite hip hop albums too. Yeah, I haven't. Rick probably James, heard respect that, that. Oh yeah, I probably haven't heard that in a long time. But yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a good one. Yeah. I, know, I I never knew that you produced that. Yeah, I'm glad recently. they. Uh, I'm glad they asked me to be a part of that. Yeah, that's dope. Yeah. When did you meet up with the rest of the Living Legends, and how did that all happen? And um, I met Mystic Journeyman, which is Sunspot Jones and Lucky I Am first. A fr through a mutual friend yeah and she introduced us those guys she she introduced me to them as like yo here's some dudes who do hip-hop they do world tours they're independent they just put their own shit out and and back then that concept wasn't too hot it was like not a lot of people were doing that like yeah. you know 
Far Side was signed and hieroglyphics were all signed to Jive and they were all coming on TV and you know all the all the people that I was looking at at that time I mean it was kind of like a general idea that if you wanted to be in the music industry at that time you needed to make like a dope demo tape submit it to some labels and then an a an a and r would tell you oh man this is dope you know yeah. why don't you do and then he would coach you on how to be even more accessible to the industry sound and then you know you'd get courted around by labels until someone signs you and so that's what 95 percent of people's you know mission was yeah, and, yeah. and these guys mystic journeymen were like fuck that Whatever we make in our basement or in our, our bedroom, that's the product right there. You know, we would take this cassette, we'll go to Kinko's, we'll make a, a little cover for it, slap a sticker on there, draw some graffiti on it, and we go out and we sell this on the street, you know. And, that, and that's before that got annoying. That's before everybody and their brother was doing it, you mm -hmm. know. So when we'd be out on the corner selling tapes, it would be the first time anyone had even seen anything like that. What? You made this you made this music at your house and you're selling it right here right now. This is you, uh, you know? And so people were excited and they were like, you know, yeah, give me that. 5 bucks. Oh shit, you know? And then they would take it home. They would come back next weekend and see us out there again. They were like, "Damn, that was dope," you know? And you got any more, you know? So then that's when I was like, "All right, I'm going to follow that." Mm -hmm. You know, Mystic Journeyman, they had a they had a show one time in L.A., and I was going to stay and watch their apartment, and they said, all right, we're going down L.A. We'll be gone for four, five, six days. When, when we come back, we want you to have your tape ready, you know? And so I was like, oh, shit. You challenge know? is on. Yeah, the challenge is on. So I was grinding, making beats, writing raps, you know, night after night, and then I came up with something that was called Don't Talk to Me, which was my just first ask that. little project. Like, and, me. you know, they came back, they were juiced. And, you know, at some point we moved in together because I had, like you asked me about my grandmother's basement, I my grandmother had uh, passed away and there was, uh, she she had this house that was empty, nobody was living in it. And so, you know, my my mother told me that I could live there. And so... That was just like a like a spot, a home base, kind of for making this music. Yeah. So that's what's up. So Journeyman joined me there, and then shortly after that, I met Eli through a friend. A friend of mine was dating Eli's cousin, and and Eli's cousin would tell me, "You need to meet my my cousin," you know. And I I was and and she was like. How old was I? I was probably 18, and he was like 15, and and that's not that much of a difference. But but when you're that back age, then, it is, I felt yeah. like oh, man, I don't want to hang around kid? no 15 year old yeah, dude. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm 18. Yeah. You know, I'm a man. And she would and she would be like, "You got to meet him. He's dope. I'm telling you." Yeah. You know, and so I met him, and he was he was already like he was more juiced on, on meeting me than I was on him at the time. And, and he knew that I had equipment and he just, he was from Southern California, but he was living in the Bay area for the, you know, newly living in the Bay area. And so mm -hmm. he was trying to meet friends and especially someone who had a sampler, yeah, yeah. you know, to make beats. For and sure. so he was all on me like, come on, when can we hang? When can, yeah. when can I come over to the basement? You know, yeah. what's up? And, uh, at first, I was a little hesitant, but then I heard his shit, and then he came over, and he was so creative, and he was already dope, and like you know, he was he was making shit that was beyond what I was making at 15, and I'm already 18, and him and Merce and Scarab were going to school together yeah, the in, in L.A., and yeah. they had they had like a little video for um, the song Sun Sprayed, which has a Nirvana, famous Nirvana sample, and they were just three, you know, little hip-hop dudes going hard, you know, and they were already going up to the Good Life Cafe and messing around in the freestyle fellowship scene. And, That's what's up. You know, so I met, I met Eli like that, and then 
I was with Mystic Journeyman one night at a re- at a radio show at, in a totally different place, and we met Merce separately. Even though Eli and Merce were friends from L.A., we met them on two separate occasions. Just like because, like I said, the hip hop scene was like eventually you're gonna yeah. see everybody who's down with what you're doing if you if you're out and about for sure, and so. You know, then I was I, then I discovered that Eli and Merce knew each other already, and I was like, "Oh shit, we met this dude over here and this dude over here, and they're dope," you know. And then it, it start hanging out and being family, and then scare. They were like, "Well, we got this homie Scarab," and then at the same time, there were these events that we that uh, Journeyman was throwing called uh, what was it called Underground Survivors hmm. in Berkeley, and that was kind of like our version of what they were doing at the good life in in Southern California. And yeah, it was yeah. like, you know, you could come up there and rap or sing or do poetry or just hang out and watch. And uh, it's kind of like you come perform two or three songs. It wasn't yeah. like dedicated to one person's show. It was like a variety show for yeah, anybody. Yeah. And, uh, you know, a lot of kids got into that and got hyped on it. And so... People would come week after week, and that's where I would see like Aesop, who ended up being in our group, and then Picasso, and you know, plugged in everybody. That's dope. Yeah, that. I was just gonna ask how you met Aesop and Picasso. Yeah, that's Picasso dope. was like he was up in Humboldt County with some other. He had his own little crew of homies, and they would come down from Humboldt to see underground survivors because they heard about it. You know? I love like the backstories of everything and how everybody just it all happened like naturally yeah. and just like it was like meant to be and it just yeah. it just happened naturally and then it's like everybody was so excited about what we each were doing and we just all wanted to be together in a in a group being cre- like you didn't want to miss out on anything yeah you know you didn't want to miss a night of underground survivors or you didn't want to miss a studio session at Mystic Journeyman's house so eventually we were like Everybody figured out a way to live in the same warehouse. That's awesome. You know? So we all, it was like 11 guys in a 2,000 square foot warehouse, one bathroom, cool. you know, m- motherfuckers building like these little bungalows out of, you know, if you if you really went all the way out, you got like two by fours and some, some uh, drywall, you know, but other people were just hanging sheets separating off little spots in this warehouse and it was like it was some crazy shit like people would walk in there and be like Whoa, what? What this is like a is camp this? right so here you guys, you guys live here yeah. you know i bet it was fun though it was so a lot fun. of good creating a lot yeah, of good times so fun. Yeah. that's what's up man but that's and then that's where i got the name because it's like 11 people living in this one spot one bathroom like i said sometimes the bathroom didn't have a door on it even and then it was just like motherfuckers in each other's space all the time so yeah, one like, bathroom for 11 yeah. people so <laughs> like getting you know g- I, I was going head to head with people yeah. and just like you know arguments here yeah. and there and so one time sunspot was like oh you're a motherfucking grouch you know and i was <laughs> like all right that's i'll run with that wait, wait, wait. What was, did you have a rap name before that no no? no you're just running yeah, I just I was running Corey Scoffer. Right, right. Yeah, that's my that's, cool. that's my name. And yeah, I was yeah. like, I mean, in Oakland, California, at that time, I go do a show and I'm the only white person in the building. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, on some Eminem eight mile shit. So so it was like a lot of people's first time seeing that in person. And so there were times when I hit the stage and it was like, oh, no, you know, like it's just on sight. Like seeing me come up on the stage, fool's like, no, man, boo, you know, yeah. throwing shit. And then Mr. Wow. Journeyman would come out and say, hold on, give him a chance. Let, let him let him rock, you know. And then I would come with the extra humble like, yo, I'm just a regular dude. You know, I'm just up here because I love hip hop. My name is Corey Scoffern. You know, I'm a simple man. And like, please listen to what I have to say because I love this shit, yeah, you know. Yeah. And so that's how it's coming, Dope. and just on some humble. And then the people would listen to me, 
And they'd be like, oh, shit, this is, this is tight, you know? Yeah. Do that's good cool. rap, you know? Yeah. I, I can so, respect that for sure. So, yeah, that's, like how, that. that's how I started. I remember on, like, one album, there's, like, somebody was saying, like, there's, like, a recording. It's like, I was, like, hanging out the window, like, throw me your bus pass. Oh, then, yeah. That sounds like some sunspot <laughs> shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What does that mean to you? Oh, you know what that that's the hustle. That's like yeah. you get on the bus. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then you hand off to your homie. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and then they get on. Yeah, yeah. We used to do yeah. that too back yeah. in the day. Yeah. For real. When did G&E form? We always had G&E. I mean, there was always, before Living Legends was Mystic Journeyman, you know, The Grouch, Eli. We all had your own thing our going. own projects, yeah, yeah. you know, before Living Legends. Living Legends happened in like, like in 95, I think, I mean, that's when I started putting out my own projects as yeah, the yeah. Grouch. And then in 97 was when Living Legends started putting out projects because we right. were like, we're all together and we don't have anything under one name, mm -hmm. you know? Sunspot made up the name, Living Legends. And then, uh, yeah, he, he was kind of like the, the leader of shit for a while. You know, That's dope. and like he had a lot of creative energy in the beginning and uh, just a force, you know, foresight of like how this shit can go, That's dope. you know, but his business was kind of fucked up. So, so at some point I had to say, yo, bro, that project you got out has all living legends on it, but it's called Sunspot. So let's make a whole living legends thing that yeah. we can all eat off. You know, that might be too much for this interview. But it's all good. <laughs> you might chop it out. Shoot, shoot. Uh, I'm not trying to talk shit. I got major love for Sunspot. But um, but yeah, that's how some of this shit developed. Yeah, we just want to get the story, you know. Yeah. Like it's cool. Like yeah. you know, there's a lot of things that go behind the scenes, right. and there's ups and downs. People have falling right. outs. People like get back together. Things yeah. happen. Like it's life. I forgot you asked about G and E though, and so yeah. that always. You know, once me and Eli finally connected, we both knew that, like, you oh, guys just hit it so off we're brothers, right you know, yeah, yeah. like, we, everything you say, I can finish your sentence, and all the ideas you have for the song, I agree, I agree with you, I want to use that sample too, you know, let's do this together, because we see the same vision, yeah. you know, and so that always was there, I don't know if it was before Living Legends or around the same time, but we always had G&E projects and songs. And That's what's up. Even on our solo stuff, we'd have a G&E, Grouch and Eli song, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and even through ups and downs of Living Legends, I just always stayed, you know, there's been times where I've been more distant with other guys, but Eli and I have always been working together throughout the whole time no more greener grasses is my favorite album right, right your guys is yeah figured i just put that out there yep. and i think uh crusader for justice is my favorite album of oh yours. really yeah okay i think i've listened to that one like i've listened to all of them like excessively but um crusader for justice i think i like that one the best thanks man. i don't know why i just there's, it just hit me and Maybe it was like the timing or yeah. something like that, but definitely like don't talk to me, fuck the dumb, like all the nothing changes, all that stuff like just was like crucial too when I was like coming up, right on, and it influenced me a lot. Appreciate it. So, uh, is is Living Legends a record label too? Uh, not not so no, much. No, yeah, no. I mean there was times where we never really put out anybody else. I mean we just had used that legendary as, music is what we called yeah, it yeah, yeah. as an umbrella to put out our own. Put project. out your own stuff. Yeah. yeah. That's dope. But it's, you know, we I had one with Eli called, you know, G&E Music. And just the labels have never been anything that's that important yeah. to, to us. It's just the title to put the music out underneath. Yeah. Because some company is asking, what label did we put this under, you know? Yeah. And so no, That inspired me a lot, too, that whole Bay Area independent hustler movement that you guys did that... That Too Short did too. And of course, I, did I forgot for to while. say and, that. Uh, yeah, that he yeah, was then, the first time I heard about selling tapes out of the trunk or whatever. It comes from Too Short. Yeah, so. yeah, definitely inspiring. And like that's the new norm now. Like everybody's yeah. doing that. That's like the standard. Everybody's yeah. like it's opposite. Fuck people the don't want to be on a. You know, people are trying to yeah. jump off of the record labels and have their own independent thing. Yeah, the way 
It yeah, should used to be. be able to like make it. You had to sign, like you're saying, you had to mm-hmm. do the whole A and R thing. Now it's like with the technology, everybody can just do their own thing and right. market themselves. Yeah. What do you think about that? Do you think it's like it's a trip because I've seen it. I I lived in a time where if I wanted my music specifically to be in Europe, I had to get on an airplane and bring it with me and deliver it to the hands of people. Mm-hmm. And now you can Click. upload yeah. and. Pow! It's worldwide, right this instant. Yeah, and that's to me is awesome. Yeah. You know, um, but it takes out some of the work, the experience, yeah. Yeah. and some of the work. But but then it comes back because it's like if somebody sees you online and they get really excited about your stuff in Brazil, you might get that call to go down to Brazil and you'll yeah. be there anyway. So yeah, yeah. that's dope. You know, there's a lot of opportunity for a lot of people now. I see so many people traveling. When we started, it, you know, independent artists were not doing world tours the way they do now. Yeah, yeah. It just wasn't happening. You know, a lot, of, a lot of rappers from back in the day weren't even doing shows like they do shows now. Yeah, yeah. You know, Too Short and E-40, they didn't, I didn't used to see them. You know, there was, there was no venues for them to play in in, the, in Oakland when yeah. we were coming up, you know. So there's like... Shit has opened up for like uh, many different avenues now. Definitely, you know? definitely. And it's, uh, I love it. I yeah. just, it just goes so quick. Like you don't know where the shit is going, you know? Like That's dope. How long are, the more and more people get into it, it, it changes the wave and the way things flow. Yeah. You know? And it's it's more acceptable now for anybody too to be into hip hop and like like oh, hip hop. Yeah. Like you were saying, you had a hard time like earlier on, and now I think it's a lot more like universal. I think people can accept like uh, different you know races and different. A lot people of the doing guards everything. are down. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I remember it's like when, a universal uh, language. You know? I remember when you would never hear hip hop playing in a restaurant. You n- never. You just wouldn't hear yeah. it. It wasn't acceptable. You know, and then a car playing loud hip hop music was like, who is that guy? Yeah. You know? They must be a gangster. Yeah. yeah. And now it's just like 45 year old white ladies yeah. playing Waka Flocka and yeah. shit or whatever. You know? Yeah. It's like, yeah. Weird. my aunt's it's bumping weird. Tupac. It's yeah. The- <laughs> I got all my, all the parents in my daughter's class from Waldorf are probably going to come see me rap. Yeah. They're like, know? we have so these CDs. So it's like, the most cool. popular parent at the parent teacher meetings. But then again, I'm just that age now. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, for sure. It's different. That's for me, but Heck yeah. Shoots, man. So we've we've talked a lot about like the past and stuff. Um is there anything any highlights that we didn't cover that you want to bring up? Not off top, not Where off top, but if sure you so. have any more questions, I'll answer them. Um I've just enjoyed, you know, being able to do what I love for 20 years plus yeah. and support my family with it, meet a lot of cool people, see it, you know, like I brought my brother on the road with me a lot when I was younger and he learned everything I knew and then took it farther than me and manages other artists and, you know, to watch that type of growth, you That's know, cool. I, I, I'm really appreciative of That's that. That's awesome. Yeah. So how did you get out to Maui? Like you've been coming out here for a while. You guys recorded the classic album out here. Um, you guys, uh, I know like a few of the CMA lyrics mentions, you know, in Paia. Mm-hmm. And um, so you guys, and then Gold Don Juan brought you out here a long uh, time ago, yeah? Yeah, Gold Don Juan, Jimmy yeah, brought up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he brought me here first. Um, we were, Hawaii has just always resonated with me. Even before I had even been here, it was like, mysterious place like Hawaii, man. Yeah. I want to go to Hawaii. Yeah, paradise. Know? Yeah, paradise. Uh, yeah. I want to be there. You know, so when people start calling up and asking for us to come play music here, I was like, oh shit, that's awesome. I'm you on know? the next plane. So I'm on it. Yeah. Like <laughs> make sure that happens, you know. For sure. A lot of the time uh, a lot of the uh opportunities that we had back then, uh Lucky I am, he was kind of like our we didn't have a manager. Like he was like our manager at one point. Dope. And during that time frame, when we first started getting Hawaii calls, yeah, I would be like, Tommy, you know, I see the Hawaii call came in, make sure, make sure we're on that. You know, let's go there. And so we 
I think we went to Oahu first, and then there was a rumor that, like, there's this dude on Maui who wants to bring us out there, right? And so um, if anybody knows Jimmy, he's, like, got the biggest heart of, of all, and he's got a big mouth, too, you know, I'm going to say. And so when I first heard him on the phone, I got on the phone with him. He was like, yeah, we're going to bring you out there, brother. Don't trip, you know, we're, you're going to come out here and... Yeah, you know, I got the money. I'm going to pay you this much. You're going to love it here in Maui. And I was like, this dude sounds like a bullshitter, you know? <laughs> and that's what I was telling, telling Tommy. That dude ain't getting us to Maui, you know? And uh, sure enough, he, he made everything happen, and he, and he got us here. Okay. And the second I got off the airplane, I saw the dude. I'm like, that's the dude right there. Like, yeah. I, did, I had never seen him before, but... Like his, like you know, his the hip hop aura, his, his, you know, he, it all matched up with what I, what I heard on the phone. And yeah. he was like just this character that I, that I love from the beginning of time, you know. What's and up? shout out to Gold on One. Shout out to Gold on One. Much respect. So, yeah, he's, a, he's a funny dude. And, um, yeah, aside from that, it was just like I always had this draw to, to Maui. So after we did that first trip, I was just looking for another excuse to get here at all yeah, yeah. times. That's what's so up. I would come out here on vacation, and I probably was the one who said, "Let's go record our album on Maui," you know. And you know, and you guys all rented a house. Yeah, and, we rented a house on yeah. West K, and everybody was down with that. And uh, yeah, we got a 2003, I think that happened, classic album. Yeah, that was fun, and you know. You, I, I remember leaving after that trip. We were here for like a month, and I have it like on video. Like we're driving to the airport, and everybody's sad, and like oh I'm just thinking. Like I, I was almost crying, you know, because I love this place so much. And so yeah. I was like, I gotta get back here. Like yeah. always thinking about when, how am I gonna get back here next? You know, I'd be washing my dishes. In California, just thinking, damn, I wish I was in Maui, yeah. you know. And so, eventually, it took a while, maybe, yeah, five years after we recorded that album. Um, had a daughter. She was, uh, you know, I was living in S Southern California, San Fernando Valley, uh, right outside of L.A. Lots of traffic, lots of smog, not so much nature. I'm a nature dude, and I was like, I had sat in the studio you know, for eight years I was there. And so I didn't do much exercising. I wasn't playing soccer. I wasn't getting out in the sun, yeah. just sitting in the studio, getting the studio tan, you know. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Like I got. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, which, you know, I guess had to happen. Um, but when my daughter was approaching two years old, I was like, I don't want to raise her yeah, here. You can't do and my that, wife yeah. was like, nah, I don't either. And yeah, so yeah. we were looking for a vacation to go do. And we had told ourselves, well, it can't be Maui this time because we're never going to see anywhere else in the rest of the world if we just keep going to Maui every time, you know. And so I said, all right. And then I got on the computer looking up for, you know, looking for another place to go besides Maui. Somehow I land on Craigslist. There's like the the ad said like epic Maui paradise, you know, opportunity, six months sublet, you know, ocean views, expansive, you know, fruit trees and views and yard and and it's it was like off the grid. It was like no no uh you know, solar power and the water came from the rain, catchment, yeah, yeah. you know. And uh, I hit the dude up. I mean, it was funny because I said, I showed it to my wife and I was like, I know we said no Maui, but look at this, you know? And she was like, all right, that looks, that looks good, you know? <laughs> and then uh, my brother called the same day and said, I want to move down to Southern California. So then my wheels started turning. I was like, you could stay at my house and we're going to go out here. And so I hit the I had hit the dude up on Craigslist, and he was like, "You're the first person who replied to this," and I just put it up like one minute ago. Oh wow! And and since you replied, I already have other people who want it, and 
And he's like, to tell you the truth, I don't want to rent it to anybody with little kids, but I'm trying to do the right thing, you know? And so it was just like on some meant to be shit because yeah. he finally said, I'm trying to do the right thing. I don't want to rent it to you because you have a little kid, but you were the first person, so I'll rent it to you. And so I came out here. We lived, you know, almost in Waylo, right by Twin Falls or whatever, mm -hmm. down a dirt road. And, you know, I got there and I couldn't hear shit. No engine noises, no people, nothing. And like being an audio guy, I was like, it freaked me out. I was like, like quiet, oh my though. God, it's so quiet. <laughs> you know, there was no light pollution, none of that stuff. And initially when I moved there, when we moved there, I thought, this is too slow. Like, I'm never going to last six months here. You know, I get stir crazy. Yeah. Uh, cabin fever. Yeah. And then uh, by the end of the six months, it was like, oh, man, I can't I can't argue with how I feel. Yeah. I feel so much better than I've felt in so long. For sure. You know, and so that was like and that like sold sold me, sold That's what's up. my fam. And we've been here ever since. Yeah. yeah. Back in the days, a haiku. Yeah. I used to come and get coconuts from me. Yeah. <laughs> Shoots, man. So you've been on Maui a few years now, yeah? It's like, like eight now. Shoots, time's flying by. Yeah. Damn, that's what's up. You're born here? I was born on Big Island. Oh, Big Island. Yeah, in Kona. Yeah. But I've been here for like 12, 13 years. Yeah. Supporting this hip-hop movement. Trying to get it. Right on. You trying got some raps, thing. too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm rapping. Word. Yeah, we played a lot of shows together. Right on. I appreciate you putting us on a lot. Yeah, like so. What, what what do you got coming up here? Like, you got any like new projects coming out? I know you G and E just came out with the tortoise. Tortoise yeah. and the crow. Tortoise. Yeah. And that the, was, sorry, that was a while ago. That was a couple of years ago. I've been kind of quiet. Um, I've I've been in the studio. I'm, I make stuff all the time, and I'm trying to get back to to like the how I used to think about putting out music in the early days, mm -hmm. where it's like, this is what I made today, this is what I made this week, boom, put it out. You yeah. know? Somewhere along the line, I lost that, and I was, I care so much, like, it's got to sound like this, the mix has to be this good. Um, the content, you know, there was a time when we were just like, the creative flow was just like, whatever comes out, Put it out. Mm -hmm. You know, that's how we thought. And there's a lot of artists who don't think like that. And they say, well, that's not on the level of what this is. And I'm only going to put out my top tier stuff. And I did that for a while. And I don't want to do it like that anymore. So I've just been recording, 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 recording. And I still have this fear inside of me that's like, this new stuff isn't as good as the tortoise and the crow. Should I sit on it? Should I cancel it? Is that even true? I don't know. Someone might like it a lot better than the tortoise and the crow. Yeah. Someone might say, oh, this is your worst shit. Someone might say, this is your best shit. Um, it's really something inside of me that I have to wrestle with and finally say, stop tripping. Yeah, put exactly. It out. I know? go through all head trips like that all the time. Like, yeah. I'm like, oh, this song is too old. I don't want to put it out. Or this yeah. song doesn't isn't good enough for like the standard that I want to put out. Yeah. And then I don't put it out. But then other people hear it and they're like, oh, that's my favorite song yeah. I've ever heard of yours. But I I feel like I'm coming to a point where I'm about to like hit this next block of like, pow, 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 pow. Here's some more music. That's what's up. You know. There's and some... I'm excited about that. I I just feel it. That's what's up. We're excited too. We want to, hear, right. some, we want to hear some new grouch. All right. Well, don't talking don't about put some the more expectations too high. Yeah. <laughs> well, don't there's want something no about stress. there's something no. about that rawness though, like of like like you were saying, like not like yeah. just putting out what you like feel yeah. that first time or like yeah. that first day or whatever. And there's yeah. something raw about that initial. That's the thing, truth. Then except for just polishing it, and polishing it, and polishing it, yeah. and then it's a beautiful, but it doesn't have that same feeling yeah. or that energy or whatever. Yeah. And you can feel that sometimes yeah. for sure. You got your show coming up too next week. May twentieth. Your birthday. That's my birthday Happy, show. You know? Yeah, I've never thrown myself my own birthday party, so I decided this was the year. That's what's up, man. Yeah, yeah sometimes you gotta treat yourself, man. Yeah. Do something good for yourself. Yeah, yeah. got it. Uh, Casanova, May twentieth, Friday. That's next Friday. Um, yeah, just come through. We're gonna have a good time. Any special guests or anything? I got my DJ, there? DJ Fresh, coming out, nice, and that's. Nice. 
that's all I need. I got um, Sierra uh, Career opening up, mm -hmm. and she's like a great friend of mine and a fantastic Amazon queen. Yeah, yeah. She's Shout out to her. It. She rehearses here too at the okay. studio too. Cool. Yeah. So it's a little bit different. It's not. I don't. What she's bringing is probably more soulful musical with a band and mm -hmm. everything. Yeah, yeah. Um, as opposed to straight up hip hop, like I'm coming with. Yeah. Have some diversity and stuff fun. like that. Yeah. Yeah, we played with punk bands before and rock bands, reggae bands. It's cool. It's good to have some diversity. Casanovas, Friday, May 20th. Right Don't on. miss that. Shoots, man. Shoots. Anything to wrap it up? You want to give a shout out to anybody out there in the Maui hip hop scene? Or nope. you want to nope. shoot shoots? Peace and love to everybody. Word, word. That's it. That's been Real Talk Hip Hop Hawaii. Shout out to Bless for the sponsorship. And we out here. Thank you guys for having me. Word. Thank you. Yep. Aloha. Aloha.